Oh, uh, Hillary, I need screen sharing. Hello, this is Dr. Karen Shackelford and welcome to the Fielding Alumni Conference event. I'm going to be talking about the book Real Characters today and I'm excited to have you all here. I know it's very early on the West Coast, so thanks to you who, who came so early today. Um, I hope I will go ahead and get started here. I'm going to turn on the chat so that I can see it as well. Okay, so today I'm going to be talking about the psychology of parasocial relationships with media characters. And this is what I'm considering the book launch for our new book from Fielding University Press um, called Real Characters. And that's the subtitle, The Psychology of Parasocial Relationships with Media Characters. Um, I am the editor of this volume and I wrote the first chapter and Jean-Pierre Isboots is the editor-in-chief of Fielding, Graduate, or Fielding University Press, and he will be joining us um, later in the hour to um, do a little interview with me, some Q&A about the book, and uh, the book wouldn't be happening without Jean-Pierre and our provost and president who sponsor uh, that program. So here is our, our book cover. It's very beautiful, I think. Jump here, had that done. And uh, I am going to give you a little bit of background. I know this is an alum event that's open to the whole university. And so I'm not gonna assume everyone's a media psychologist. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about myself to kind of give you some orientation to where I'm coming from with the book. And um, then I'll tell you about um, what parasocial relationships are, for instance, um, if you haven't heard that term. So this was just published in January, very exciting. Um, I, uh, uh, so for some background about me, I am a social psychologist. I went to the University of Missouri, Columbia, and I'm originally from St. Louis, Missouri, born and raised there. And uh, I uh, realized during graduate school that really what I wanted to study was media, media and social psychology, anyway, that intersected. And um, today's talk is a lot about stories, narratives, and characters, um, including pop culture stories and how they relate to actors and the roles they play. And that's what this book is about. Um, so here's where the psychology comes in. We all read books, watch movies, watch television, and we think of that as entertainment by and large, which it is. Um, and we think about some of the motives that, that bring us in, such as now during the pandemic, we're inside, we're not traveling as much. So we might think about how we've binge watched things. Um, for instance, I have binge watched season three of uh, Stranger Things, watched uh, the first couple seasons with my kids. And uh, some of the things that I uh, think about as a researcher are uh, why do we watch certain stories? And people have been talking about that with um, for instance, why do, why do I think um, that I watched Stranger Things? If you're not familiar, it's a sci-fi fantasy story about a group of teenagers. Um, I think it's in the late 80s or thereabouts, early 90s. And they, um, uh, they in, encounter this monster, for lack of a better term. And it's, there's a lot to it. It's a great show. But it's young people who don't feel prepared for something dealing with a huge and scary problem. And so I think that's, you know, I have to psychoanalyze myself, you know? So uh, I think that's why I was drawn to it. I like to see the idea that people who don't think they're prepared 
um, but who have goodwill and they move forward and they try to do everything they can for each other and to solve the problem. So I think that's gratifying to watch. Um, and binge watching, I could talk a lot about that, but it's, um, you know, back in the day, we didn't have the opportunity to do that, right? The Our favorite show would come on, uh, The Dukes of Hazard on Friday night when I was little. <laughs> and um, that was mostly about Bo and Luke Duke, I think, which we'll talk about because they're characters, right? Um, but, uh, you know, there's reasons that we hook into these things and uh, things that we get out of them. And so one of my missions, I guess, is to um, talk about the things other than the fact that we do it for entertainment. So what is happening psychologically and then what can we gain? I focus on things like, can we gain meaning? Like I was telling you about um, my consumption of stranger things um, that had a meaning for me and it was, it was, it was um, something I was aware of from the beginning, um, but I'm a media psychologist. Um, and what does all that mean? What can we use it for? Um, a lot of my research is also about intersecting social groups or categories. So intersection of gender and race, for example. And um, I've done some stuff about characters in video games and intersections of gender and race and what that looks like, for instance, Way back in the day, I did a study about video game characters, and I found that 80% um, of the Asian characters in a giant sample that I had were martial artists. So these are things about stories that we tell, you know. Um, and so the stereotype would be if you see an Asian person in real life, you would think, oh, they're a martial artist, you know. Um, the idea is, especially if the group is a numerical minority, then the incidences that we see are these events in the media um, fill our minds. And we would not like to say that, like I get my information on other people through TV or because um, it makes us feel silly, but our brain doesn't draw a hard line between face-to-face <clears throat> -face life and a story. Um, not as hard as we think it would be. Um, for example, there was a study that most adults in this particular study understood um, the criminal justice system more as it is portrayed in the media than as it actually happens. Like for instance, in a detective story, the detective who's the protagonist um, usually knows who did it and they go, they zero right in on that person. That's not how it actually works. Um, things with search warrants, other things, people understood that because they had watched Law and Order or, or whatever it was. So that's, I talk a lot about words like reality and fantasy, truth and fiction. Um, and so that's the line that I'm always working on. Um, so in this particular book, um, I was interested in getting into the character aspects. And one of those character aspects is called parasocial relationships. And there's another one called identification. And I'll be talking about those as we go through parasocial this is a preview here, means not quite social, which it means um, not fully relational. And so it means like a one-sided, non-reciprocal relationship. So if I have a crush on Chris Hemsworth, that is called a parasocial romantic relationship, you know, that um, I think, ooh, Chris Hemsworth, you know, <laughs> which I do. <laughs> um, but, you know, and then there's different degrees of that, like uh, fans who join his fan club or whatever, or people and the pathological end who go to his house and you know see if he's there. So, um, but in my work as a social psychologist, we are uh, studying quote unquote normal psychology, which means things that most people do. And so they 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 fall on a mellow kind of level. Uh, it, it's my colleagues in clinical who would study them if you go to Chris Hemsworth's house and you're you're stalking him. So that's not that's not what we're focusing on here. We're focusing on everyday psychology with things that we do every day, like watch Stranger Things or Thor or the Marvel, you know, different Marvel movies or Black Panther or whatever it is we're reading or watching. Um, I'm really thrilled that I had two current media psychology students who were the associate editors on this project. And thanks to Jean-Pierre for letting me do that. They were both um, just pivotal in this project, Ken Walker and Kimberly Dean. Thank you. So I'm going to just briefly show you the table of contents to give you a, a hint at what is happening inside the book. 
Um, obviously, I'm not going to read these word for word. Uh, you, you can do that on your own, but I thought I would put the table of contents into this PowerPoint and this will be shared so you can look at it anytime. As I said, I wrote the first chapter and I'll be talking about some of those things. It's called Mapping the Constellation of Psychological Experiences Involved in Our Connection with Fictional Characters and with Actors. And I'll talk about that. Um, these are, I just want to point out, these are some of the most well-known, most influential authors in this field of narrative psychology, parasocial relationships, um, identification, and these are just uh, heroes of mine. Keith Oatley, for instance. Keith and his colleagues Raymond Marr and associates uh, Sonia Jikik, they have talked about um, stories as a social simulation um, and everything that that means. And that's what I asked Keith to write about. When you, um, if you're thinking about doing a, an edited volume, when you're the editor of an edited volume, you get to set the table of contents and the authors, and then it's up to you to try to recruit them. Um, and I was uh, very fortunate that um, most everyone said yes, um, that I asked. And by the way, Ken, who started, Ken Walker, who started working with me on the project early, I had a list of people that I had in mind for authors. And then we did extra library research just to make sure um, we had covered all of our bases and we were sure that there weren't invitations that we wanted to, um, to do that we left out. Now, there are lots of people that I didn't get a chance to invite just because you know, the book is only so long and I wanted to balance it out between different research areas, et cetera. Um, Melanie Green, um, media psych uh, students and alums will recognize her name. She is a co-author of one of the, um, the strongest and most uh, influential theories in this field. It's called the transportation theory. And transportation is similar to other words that you may be familiar with like engagement. Um, and so part of entering a story world and getting lost in a story and connected to the characters is uh, the emotions involved. And so um, what you feel when you watch a story like that, if it doesn't touch you, if it doesn't draw you in, then the things that I'm talking about don't apply. Um, that's something important to note. We watch television um, at a distance, not engaging with it sometimes. This is all about when we engage, when we're transported. Um, Carlos is um, a recent grad and a wonderful student. And I asked him to write a story, uh, a, excuse me, a, a chapter, thank you, Karen. Um, brain has engaged. Um, a chapter based on his um, subject area of his dissertation, which was about um, enjoying sad stories. And you've got, if you've got access to the Fielding Library, definitely look up Carlos' dissertation. Um, he used, he's from Mexico and he used a Mexican um, uh, saga um, in which there were a lot of sad emotions for the characters and studied um, psychological reactions to that, including some psychophys stuff. Gail Stever um, has spent a lot of her career studying fan relationships. And um, she writes about uh, ce uh, celebrities um, and parasocial relationships here. Um, Dave Ewaldson has worked with Michael Slater and, and that group of scholars. And um, he studies something called retrospective imaginative involvement, which is uh, after I have watched a film, for example, then I think, uh, I imagine as if I were um, in a relationship with those characters. Uh, Reva Tukaczynski is a student of um, Jonathan Cohen, who I'll be talking about a, a lot through here. He is the go-to theorist for identification. Um, Dara Greenwood, Bradley Bond, and Alex, excuse me, Alice Aldukoff, they talked about um, female representation. Um, two of our graduates, Aidan Hirschfield and Melody Medcalf, talked about LGBTQIA plus characters. And Pam Rutledge, our faculty in media psych, talked about a real world application that she did a narrative analysis of, of the Predator teaser. My husband, yes, nepotism. Um, Lee Shackelford, I'm kidding, he's very good. My husband's a playwright and a screenwriter and teaches those things. And he's also an uber fan of so many things and belongs to fan communities, including Doctor Who. And Lee and Clarence and Kyle do a podcast about Doctor Who. And I asked them from the fan community standpoint to write about um, the character of the doctor. It's not Doctor Who, by the way, if you're a fan, uh, you know that. Um, the doctor is what he's called, or she now. It's a, it's a woman now. Um, how, what it is about the doctor 
that they have heard from fans. They've talked to many fans, they've gone to many conferences, they've thought about this themselves. What is it that draws people into the doctor? And this connects to what I was saying about meaning in story, that for instance, if I'm a Doctor Who fan, to me that has meaning. The doctor means something and he stands for certain ideals and uh, I, that I'm perhaps drawn to that story for that reason. Ken, um, uh, a student that I mentioned, who's an excellent student, um, wrote about social change in real characters and his dissertation is planned to be about um, Native American and uh, people and history and how we can teach history that is sensitive to what actually happened and um, kind of rewrite some stereotypes, hopefully in young people's lives. Specifically, he's had a long-term interest in um, Native Americans and, and um, writing stories uh, about them. So, uh, and then finally, David Giles. David Giles is a European scholar who is the first person that I know of to write a book called Media Psychology. And um, he's a very well-known scholar in the field. And so I wound up the table of contents with his contribution where he talks about some issues that are going on and some potential solutions. So, so that is the book in a nutshell. Now I'm going to uh, take a breath here and uh, reorient you to the topic and kind of tell you a little bit of a narrative about how I landed in this research because it's not where I uh, intended to land, but I'm glad I did land here. So I was trained, I got my PhD in 1997. I was trained as an experimental social psychologist, hardcore. Um, my advisor is Craig Anderson and he is a media violence scholar and he is um, an excellent statistician and methodologist. And uh, Craig and I, I guess our brains were uh, aligned and we were more like the picture on the left here of the person um, typing into screens and looking at data. And I'm presenting this here as an idea that um, some people uh, respond well to data. And we were both people like that. We thought facts are the things that change people's minds. We have to find out what the facts are and use those facts. But actually, um, we both knew that in social psychology and in the persuasion literature, um, you cannot change a, an emotion-based attitude with facts. So. If you say like, for instance, um, in my own state of North Carolina, um, uh, uh, it seems like a million years ago now with all this happened, but there was an issue with um, a transgender um, using, uh, using the bathroom and how it was labeled related to gender identity. And um, the facts were that transgender people do not, um, you know, attack people in bathrooms, it's ridiculous. But um, the thing is, you would think if you were logical that you could tell people that and give them the facts and they'd say, okay, my bad. <laughs> let's just, let's, let's chill out and move on with our lives. But no, they will not. People aren't waiting for the facts. Essentially, they um, think in a different way. And when I say they, I mean me too. Uh, even though there are people who do digest facts and, you know, I would love to look at consumer reports and decide, you know, what's the best toaster. But, um, there's actually studies on data like that, like consumer reports, where people are more apt to believe a story from their next door neighbor about toasters rather than the data from consumer reports. Again, some people are not like that, but um, it's frustrating to people if we think of politics of late. Again, you can't just tell people what the facts are because that's not where their attitude is coming from. So that's not where their attitude change is going to go. And there's a whole branch of narrative psychology called narrative persuasion. And that's about how we how stories can persuade and what are the mechanisms for that persuasion um, and how can we use that information. So these two slides, here's how I think of that. The left slide is me in graduate school saying, okay, we just got to come up with the data so we can tell everybody how the world works. And um, the right side is my vision of a storyteller, like, oh, like, the left side is a scientist and the right side is like a humanities person. They're telling stories, you know, like my husband <laughs> and they're, they're great creative people, but they're sort of out there, you know, but then I realized, uh Oh, the truth came to haunt me because I need to jump from the left slide to the right slide because the fact is that um, 
people digest stories. We all think in stories and we have to understand that. It's not fanciful, it's not entertainment, it's not frivolous, it's the way we think. And so once I came to understand that and accept that for myself as a scientist, then I realized I needed to study it and I needed to use that information um, in any way that if I was suggesting uh, an attitude change or a persuasion, um, I have to understand how people think. So I jumped to the, I jumped to the storyteller slide. So this is a quote from um, a, a book that uh, Cynthia Vinnie, one of our alums, and I published in uh, 2020. It's very odd, by the way. I published a book called Finding Truth in Fiction in 2020, just at the time the pandemic was starting. And then this book came out just at the time that people were storming the Capitol. And I started to think, I don't need to write any more books because weird things happen. But that is, of course, not how it worked. But um, here's a quote from our book about um, story. Uh, to say that people love stories sounds fanciful or even frivolous. It makes it sound like stories are just something we do to amuse ourselves. But narratives are far from simple entertainment devices and more than excellent teachers. Narrative is the fundamental structure of human thought. In other words, stories are quite simply the way we think. And that's one thing I've learned as a social psychologist and a media psychologist. And I'm going to elaborate on, on how that is. Um, a lot of my understanding of story in this way comes from Beach and Bissell's book in 2016. I think I have it here, actually. I'll show you. I'll show it to you. This is one of my Bibles. If you look through here, I have all kinds of stars and arrows and exclamation marks of, of you know, a million things that I think are important, and I'll share some here. So what does story do? Story imposes structure. If you took an intro to psych class, you remember learning about gestalt principles of organization, that if we have a, a drawing that just has some sketchy lines on the outside, we will impose a, a structure onto that. So visually and in, in social worlds too, we impose structure on what we see. We impose purpose, causality, and time, and it makes us feel that we're in control. Stories in our minds organize things into actors and actions and events in a way that makes sense to us. So this is um, breaking some of that down. So the premise is that the human brain thinks in stories. And that's the premise of this, uh, a new theory of mind, the theory of narrative thought by Beach and Bissell. Um, as I say in chapter five of finding truth in fiction, stories are the fundament, fundamental form of human thought. So what do I mean by that? What do I mean by story? Because story is such a basic word, it, it can be interpreted in a lot of different ways. So what do I mean that we think in story? If you boil down our most fundamental ideas, they go into the form of people and things like actors and objects, like, um, Joe uh, picked up the ball, um, events and causes. Um, she popped the balloon with a pin, an actor and action. And uh, I use the word actor, meaning one who acts, but it also maps onto our idea of actor, person who is embodying the um, protagonist, for instance. So story, and character go hand in hand. In this talk, I'm talking a lot about story, but really stories, um, the actor and the action, um, the person and the situation, the character and the story, they're pretty much inextricably bound. And I have on here a note to myself, for example, Superman. I was just writing about this. Um, you can say, um, Okay, Superman is a character in a story, set of stories. He's a character that many people identify with and follow and love. But when you say Superman, really the name of the character embodies both the character and the story, because if you take them apart, it becomes kind of comical. So if you say Superman, what you mean is superhero, man who saves people, uh, person who flies through the sky, you know. Um, what if Superman were in a story that had nothing to do with heroic actions? You know, Superman 
is hanging out at his house in his pajamas, you know, doing Zooms with uh, Batman or something. I don't know, whoever his best friends are. Um, people who know about superheroes, I realized that could be an ironic statement. Anyway, um, so Superman, um, if he's not doing heroic things, then in a way he's not Superman. You know, we can play with that. But my point is the actor and the role, the character and the story, they're, they're bound together. Um, so here's an example of a story we all know, right? Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water. Jack fell down and broke his crown and Jill came tumbling after. Well, um, Jack and Jill, they are the characters. They're the actors. They take an action. For example, they went up the hill. Jack fell down and we know that falling down broke his crown. Those are, those are the things I mean by causation, like falling uh, caused his crown to break. Um, an actor, Jack, did some action, fell down. And so, and then there's a larger reason why we tell that story or, you know, things that we can talk about. So fairy tales, for instance, would, would fit into all of this. Um, so here are some things that, that I understand from this theory of narrative thought that has been very um, influential on me. So one of the things that I have quoted many times over the years, um, it, oops, I got my quotation marks wrong there. I need to fix that. But the quote is, a good story is better than a true one. By the way, I need to apologize to Beach and Bissell because I saved that idea in my head and I misquoted it because in my head, they said a good story is better than the truth. And I have quoted that as that, but Actually, I looked back and what they said is a good story is better than the than a true one. Um, that to me is a million dollar statement because we, we can look around the political world right now. Um, and if we deeply understood this, um, we would do things maybe more um, powerfully than, than we sometimes do. So what does it mean a good story is better than a true one? In the theory of narrative thought, um, the authors go through and talk about what um, what it means that something is a story, like we were talking about on the last slide. Um, and then, you know, so what are the sort of elements of that and what's important about that? I'm gonna pause that and say something here to the side about the difference between story and narrative, according to this theory. Story is what we just talked about. An actor does an action. That's a story, a simple story. Um, and that's how we organize thoughts. Um, narrative is that, the story, plus everything that goes on inside the um, viewer or reader or consumer's mind. So they theorize that when I am reading a story, I read it, but I am understanding it all with my brain and that what my brain does is add an awful lot of things. One thing that I think is easy to understand is that my brain adds my own biases, my own beliefs, my own attitudes. So if I see something that I have an attitude about, my brain interprets that through my past experience. It adds autobiographical memory we know that from McDonald and colleagues research and other research. So if I'm watching, what I mean by autobiographical memory is that um, if I'm watching, uh, oh gosh, uh, Stranger Things, let's say, and um, it's a scene has objects, you know, a can of Coke or um, a board game or a sweater or something that reminds me of my own childhood, for instance, then that might uh, click off in my head lots of memories about that. So that's um, what McDonald and colleagues called IAMs, involuntary autobiographical memories, that spontaneously, involuntarily, that story will click off, will evoke um, uh, connected thoughts in my mind, connected emotions and stories. Uh, in addition to that, the narrative also uh, includes things like tactile, memories, sensory memories, smells, sounds, touches, sights. And so uh, <laughs> since I'm talking about stranger things, I could say, uh, uh, you know, 
the late 80s reminds me of the scent of polo cologne. I think every boy who I went to school with um, had a jug of polo cologne that they wore. So um, if I'm watching Stranger Things, I might almost smell the polo, you know? Um, and so that's my, my, what's happening in my head. So that entire thing takes me as the viewer and that's my narrative. The story is just, let's say what's in the script plus the actors who are embodying the roles, et cetera, et cetera. So we all have the same story that we're watching if we watch Stranger Things, but only I have my narrative. Um, you know, if I had grown up halfway around the world and didn't have that same American childhood, um, then I would have different, you know, I, my whole narrative would be different. So each of us truly, only experiences, we are the only person who experiences that narrative that way. I'm the only person who has my exact autobiographical memories, sensory memories that go with that. And Stranger Things for me would be a good example of that since it is set in an era um, that I lived through, the, the American um, you know, 1980s. Uh, so what's, uh, go back to what's a good story. Um, I don't mean that in the way that people normally mean it, like enjoyable. Good, um, this is sort of a rhetorical explanation that good is, um, according to Beach and Bissell, plausible and coherent. So when I say a good story, this is their quote, and I believe it too, a good story is better than a true one. That means a plausible, coherent story is better than um, one that is what actually happened. A plausible, coherent story is resistant to change. So here's a, a fact from their research. We tend to prefer, people tend to prefer simple, untrue stories to complex ones, especially if, if we don't understand those complexities. Again, I say, wow, we all need to like go to some school where we learn this because it applies to so much that we see in politics right now. It's not just politics, it's everything. It's everything because people's brains run on stories. So it's human relations. If you're from HOD, it's organizational and, and individual behaviors. Um, if you're a therapist, it's what your client believes. You know, They believe a plausible coherent story, um, especially when we don't understand the complexities. Now, there are individual differences in affinity for complexity. There's a, there's a variable called a need for cognition, for instance, and people have studied need for cognition. Um, people who are high in the need for cognition are more likely to be transported into a narrative. Um, so there's a, there's a whole picture of, of this. But um, so here's my interpretation of this idea that uh, we tend to prefer simple, untrue stories to complex ones. Uh, there's a theory in social psych that we are what's called cognitive misers, and that means that we are kind of lazy cognitively. Um, to put it more uh, kindly, we have a lot going on in our minds. We have a lot that we have to process and do. And so we don't have time to deeply process or understand everything. And so we take shortcuts. And uh, so what are those shortcuts? They're things that you might not think of. So. We tend to prefer simple, untrue stories to complex ones. Well, um, my interpretation is that if a story fits a simple stereotype, an idea that we have in our brain that this is how things work, you know, it could be anything like where there's smoke, there's fire, that's how things work, um, then we will extrapolate that and use it to judge real life behavior. So if someone uh, casts aspersions on someone, then we think, oh, there's probably a reason they did. And there's, there's data that um, if someone's name is associated in a newspaper headline with a crime, then even if it says like Joe Jones acquitted of treason or whatever, um, we still go, oh, Joe Jones treason. Well, those two things go together. <laughs> so that's what I mean, like cognitive miser, we're just gonna you know, stick those two together. Um, but here's my example um, of a simple stereotype. Um, uh, a man is in love with his secretary. I'm calling that a stereotype. A stereotype is, a, is an idea about a type of person and what they would tend to do. So if you think like traditional gender roles, boss and secretary, we all, you know what I mean when I say that. It's a stereotype. It's a perhaps caught in time stereotype, but it still exists. 
So if you say Senator so-and-so is in love with his secretary, that's a good story because it fits with a, um, a simple idea that we have and it's a, like a culturally shared um, norm or understanding. We don't know how many people are in love with their secretaries. We don't have the base rate data. We don't have, uh, you know, there's so much that we don't know. Um, so much that is kept private and is distorted by public conversations. So we don't know, but we think we know that that's a thing that happens. Boss is in love with his secretary. Not that it doesn't happen, but we don't know how much. Um, what if the truth is like very much more complex than that? And as I say on the slide here, that is how real life often works. Like um, the idea of stranger than fiction, you know, life is actually stranger than fiction in many ways. Um, people don't want to sit still for the complex explanation of what actually happened with that boss and their secretary, because it's just easier to think, I know what happens with bosses and secretaries. Um, emotions are also part of the narrative and just our natural inclination towards things, you know, like we're drawn to ideas about sex, for instance, because that's a, you know, fundamental human motive. So um, we think simplistically like this. And so let's think of something that would, would that would go with yourself, something that um, people might think about you just because it's a, it's a vast stereotype or something like that they're just going to be apt to think that if anyone gives them the slightest notion that it might be true because it just clicks into oh i know how that works okay then that's probably true when in reality often the truth is complex and not that stereotype um, emotions are part of the narrative they're added by the person consuming the story but they also exist in the story so you know people study just music and narrative, for instance, about how music is so fundamental and it evokes emotion. The facial expression of the actor, that evokes emotion as well. Beach and Michelle talk about public narratives and private narratives. We have lots of public narratives um, and there are multiple forms of public narratives, but one of them is an ideological narrative. So that would be like religion. That's an ideological narrative that's shared in a culture. It would be like, what's the meaning of life? Um, and they note, and I kind of put this because it's just so in the moment, ideological narratives tend to be divisive. Yes, they do. Um, and so we don't think of them necessarily as a, as a human being, we might not think of that as an ideological narrative, something that I was socialized into and now believe. It's hard to sort of undo our training, you know, things that we've learned from childhood, like religion or, uh, you know, what's right and wrong or what's our orientation towards the world. Um, so there's public narratives, um, pop culture narratives, like I'm talking about films, like It's a Wonderful Life that I have uh, still love here on the screen. Those are our shared narratives. So if I said, what's the meaning of life, an ideological narrative from a film, um, might be the message of the film, It's a Wonderful Life. So um, not to oversimplify it, but most of us have probably seen that story or have heard of it. The takeaway, I guess, is something to the effect of, uh, I think they say it right at the end of the film, like a man is never poor who has friends, you know? So what's a good life? George Bailey, the, the main character, is a very likable protagonist and we watch him go through emotional ups and downs and he wonders, if his life is worth it, he becomes suicidal. He thinks he's ruined everything and it's it's a mess. And then his angel, that's part of an ideological narrative that angels exist, um, takes him through the story of his life and recasts it into a new narrative, which is that you, you know, some people would be dead if you weren't here. Some people would be um, worse off if you weren't here. You have done so much good. So uh, the meaning of life is doing good for others. That's an ideological public narrative. We also have private narratives, which are, for example, your story about who you are, your identity. So there's no one story about who you are, and there's no ultimately true story about who you are, in a sense, um, not, not set in concrete. And so we construct a narrative of our identity and who we are. Um, 
that is something that media psychology students can study. Um, for instance, I remember Karen Wiley Rappaport, one of our graduates, she did um, these devices like um, Apple Watches, uh, fitness devices, and people constructing identity stories from um, the data on their fitness device. So for example, she used uh, Dan McAdams work about um, the redemptive self. McAdams wrote a book called The Redemptive Self that says we like redemption story arcs. So a redemptive story arc would be um, I had a challenge and I overcame it. So with your Apple Watch, you might be, she had these narratives from real people who said like, I had gained weight and I wanted to lose weight. And so this, these are my data and it shows that I, you know, chose a plan, stuck to it and reached my goals. That's a redemptive story arc. So it can be applied to part of your identity or a holistic statement of who you are. Many public narratives are about causes, um, what causes what. So in, in the George Bailey story, an angel, and um, there's uh, the gods in heaven, and he sends down the angel Clarence to, to work with George Bailey. We might think providence intervenes, the universe or karma. So pop culture, like It's a Wonderful Life, the film, um, contains public narratives, shared narratives, and, and shared narratives are part of our culture. So I had fun with this one. You may have seen Bernie Sanders and his little mittens from the inauguration. He's been showing up. This is actually the skating rink that I used to skate at when I was a child in Missouri. And someone had put Bernie Sanders there cleaning up the, the skating rink floor. But um, I've been talking a lot about story. And as I mentioned uh, about Superman, the character and the story are, are intertwined. And characters mean, um, protagonists, they mean actors in a role, they mean um, people in our lives who are taking actions. Um, so you can't, I'm talking about story, but you can't sort of, you can try to separate out that Venn diagram, but they are interwoven. Even um, a, a senator like Bernie Sanders, he is a character. Now, especially now um, where the world is becoming more globally interconnected, we have to understand that some of us actually know Bernie Sanders, right? And he's obviously a real person, but he's also a character. Um, it may be that we never meet him, but he is a person in our mind and we understand him. We understand him as we might understand our uncle or someone else. He is real and our uncle is real. And um, George Bailey specifically is not real and that he's a character, he's fictional, but it's not as simple as that. Um, for instance, um, when Barack Obama was running for president in 2000 for the 2008 election, um, I took my kids to the local high school to see him. And so I have literally seen Barack Obama and he's touched my daughter in the head when she was a, a little girl. She was four at the time. Um, but so he's real and he's, you know, but um, he's also a character in all of our shared realities. He's a figure from popular culture and he's someone we have a shared understanding of. So a lot of what I understand um, about a figure like Bernie Sanders or Barack Obama is, um, is a construction, a shared social construction, and it's imaginal. So all of this stuff is about imagination. Like I could use that label for everything I was talking about here. I imagine what Bernie Sanders would do in different situations. I do a being Bernie Sanders impersonation. I'm not going to do it right now. But um, I imagine what he would do in different situations, or you can imagine what Barack Obama would say in a certain situation, but they are a character too. They're a character in our stories. Um, because they're public figures, we share their, um, their understanding. Uh, from the um, inauguration, one of the things I found the most humorous was that Bernie Sanders um, looked like he had just picked up his mail and walked right up. <laughs> right over to the inauguration, which later, thank you, Don Grant, for telling me that it was revealed that those were his tickets to the inauguration he was carrying. But it's a cute story about that's the kind of person that he is. You know, we have Lady Gaga in a you know fabulous gown and all this stuff, and Bernie's there with his, his mittens and his mail. So those are characters too. And we're characters in other people's realities. And if you know me, you may have an idea of me um, that, that may fit some stories that seem like good stories to you, or they may fit with who I actually am because you have a lot of experience with me. 
And who am I? Do I know? You know, does any of us know? This is a, this is a psychological exercise. Uh, so in the film, the character that you identify with may be a protagonist. Um, it also could be an actor. It could also be a personality. Sorry for all the stuff on this slide. It's for take it home and look it over in depth later. This is from a table from Finding Truth in Fiction. Again, I wrote with our alum, Cynthia Vinnie, wonderful alum who lives in LA. Um, so the term parasocial, again, is um, an imagined, um, a parasocial interaction is an imagined interaction with a media figure. Um, I like to talk a little bit about some of my own parasocial relationships in part because being a fan of something um, is sometimes a devalued identity. Sometimes people make fun of fans, although that's getting better. So I like to, you know, and when people say like a psychologist is gonna study you, that sometimes think, it seems like invasive and not something you want. And so I, I like people to understand that I'm a fan, that I do these things, that I do all the things that, that we've been talking about here. So um, uh, I will just share with you that um, I joke a lot that I have a crush on 1960s William Shatner, so that's a parasocial relationship, but uh, maybe this is a uh, sad news about me, but I don't actually think a lot about William Shatner. Someone I think a lot about, I think a lot about Barack Obama and Michelle Obama, and I think a lot about Stephen Colbert. And Stephen Colbert is an interesting one because he was a character on his original show, and now he's playing himself. Um, I think a lot, like if I'm going to have a sort of a fantasy relationship with someone, I will imagine myself talking to or telling jokes to Stephen Colbert or Jon Stewart. I like to, it gives me pleasure to imagine that I would talk to them. Of course, I would love to have dinner with Barack and Michelle Obama. So those are parasocial relationships that I have. Um, and I'll talk about, um, I wanna get to the point, the part about um, uh, identification because that's a little bit different. What I write about in chapter one of Real Characters um, is advice that I'm trying to give to the field, um, to this field, in terms of our use of our terms. So specifically, I'm honing in on the term identification and the terms parasocial phenomenon. And so there was a chapter, uh, excuse me, an article written recently by um, Liebers and Schramm and the title of the article is something like um, 60 years of parasocial um, research. And in it, they point out that we have a lot of trouble with the parasocial terms. We, we use them sort of in a sloppy way. Um, and I'm arguing in my chapter that the same thing is true for um, identification. For one thing, identification is a word that, that is used in the everyday vernacular and we think we know what it means. But if I say identification, um, not just as a psychologist, but as a person, um, if I say identification, you may think you know what I mean by that, but there are many different kinds of identification. And I think um, we have to be very clear or we're just muddying the waters, both in our own research, but also this is something that the public wants to know about. And so if we're unclear, um, then we're not doing our best as scientists to send the message about our work. So in chapter one of Real Characters, I write about different kinds of identification. I talk about empathy a lot because one of the, what, what I think is one of the most exciting findings in our whole literature is narrative psychology literature, is that um, when people are more exposed to fiction, they are better at taking other people's perspectives and they are better at empathy. And so the world needs empathy. The world needs the skill of perspective taking. And so if we can cultivate that, um, then I think it's really important. Some forms of identification are about empathy and perspective taking and others, not so much. And so, um, oh, I'm going to actually, if you don't mind, skip a couple because I see that Jean-Pierre is here and I, I want to, uh, I was going to talk about some of those chapters, but um, let me skip over to um, Jonathan Cohen, his definition of identification. He says that identification requires that we forget ourselves and become the other, that we assume for ourselves the identity of the target of our identification. So 
identity, we take on the identity. So um, if I identify with, um, oh gosh, how about that new show about uh, playing chess? Oh gosh, so sorry, I'm gonna forget the name of it, but there's a young woman who's the main character and she's very smart and she plays chess. Sorry for the, the crappy like description of that show. It's a queen's gambit. Thank you, brain. I always talk to my own brain. So anyway, I, uh, if I identify with her, I'm like, I know what it's like to be a smart, awkward girl. Um, but I was never that kind of smart girl. I was not a chess or yeah, chess champion. I, I barely know how to play chess. So um, I'm going into another reality, another time in history, another body, another person. And the idea is I forget me, Karen, and I become her, the character. That's identification. That is what I mean when I say identification. But the problem that I was trying to reveal in that chapter is that we use that one word for multiple things. Here are some types of identification that um, narrative scholars have studied. Wishful, similarity, and affinity. Oh, I got wishful on there twice. I must really like that one. <laughs> so. Um, Wishful is there are items that measure wishful identification like I wish I could be more like T'Challa, for instance. Similarity is like demographic similarity, like I am a white woman and so is the character in the Queen's Gambit. Um, affinity is liking, so I just like Superman or whatever it is. So I like Superman is very different from I am imagining the world as if I were Superman. I personally do not do that, um, but I do that a lot when I'm actually processing a narrative. I think of them as internal versus external. And some of my work, uh, for instance, um, Cynthia Vinny and Anna Barch and some of our colleagues and I developed a, an inventory called the Fan Identity Scale. And my biggest impetus for that was to identify this internal um, connection that we have with a fandom, with a character, the stuff about taking on the experiences as if it were me. Because I think that a lot of fandom research actually takes a step back and does the, what I call external, which is like fans go to Comic-Con, they talk to other fans. Um, so really I'm talking about um, the self and other distinction. Is it internal to me or is it something external and behavioral that I do in the world. I see Jean-Pierre is here. I'm gonna cover one more topic, Jean-Pierre, and then Jean-Pierre has kindly uh, agreed to, um, to interview me a little bit about, about real characters. So in the book, Finding Truth in Fiction, um, chapter three is actually my favorite chapter and it's about actors and roles. And uh, to write that book, by the way, if you're thinking of collaborating with a colleague to write a book like Cynthia and I did, um, what we did was we divided up the chapters and we each wrote roughly half the chapters and then we swapped chapters and then we edited each other's chapters. And so sometimes I'll say I said or whatever, or what I mean is that I wrote that chapter initially and, and this is what I'm thinking about. And uh, chapter three on actors and roles is when I initially wrote and it's Cynthia edited and um, something that I think about a lot um, and I think is pivotal. So. Think of an actor in a role. For instance, Robert Downey Jr. and Iron Man. Anybody, I mean, you think of George Bailey and um, uh, Jimmy Stewart, um, uh, Captain Kirk and William Shatner, whatever, you know, T'Challa and um, Chadwick Boseman. So actors in roles, um, Hermione Granger and Emma Watson. Um, th the question that I try to answer in that chapter is not um, who is the actor and who is the role, but what is the person perception um, uh, activity that we go through? When I look at um, Jimmy Stewart, do I think that he is George Bailey? How do I understand that? And I take the reader through the process that of course we could laugh at ourselves and say, ha ha, I know that you know William Shatner is not Captain Kirk. I know that Leonard Nimoy is not Spock, but, um, but do I? And, and there's, there's a lot of psychological juggling that goes on there. And I just go through that process. So let's take Leonard Nimoy and Mr. Spock from Star Trek. Um, they, Mr. Spock and Leonard Nimoy have the same body, right? They look identical because Leonard is the actor who embodied the role. 
Um, so how do I know where one begins and ends? The normal process of person perception is to say, I see a person and they're behaving in this way. So I attribute that behavior to their personality. That's the kind of person they are. Well, um, the line gets really blurry and actually Nemo is a great example of this because he was a method actor and method actors try to really embody the role. And uh, I watched a, um, a, a biography that his son, Leonard Nimoy, um, created about the character Spock. And Spock, if you don't know, is um, supposed to be uh, from the planet Vulcan and he is very, um, he's much less emotional than human beings are. He's half human, half Vulcan. And Vulcans are not emotional. And so um, Leonard Nimoy, being a, a method actor, spent a lot of time in character, even when he was off screen, because he didn't think it was easy for him to turn it off and turn it on. And that ended up having ramifications on his family, as this film about Spock uh, reveals. So was Leonard Nimoy Spock? Was he the actor or the role? He's actually the perfect example, because Leonard Nimoy wrote two books, one called I Am Not Spock and one called I Am Spock. Um, but all of this is to say that it's not as easy as that we could just make this statement, they're separate, one is fictional and one is real, especially in this case, one is an, from an, a fictional planet, right? But it isn't that simple. There's, um, and, and this leads to our not understanding some things. So, for example, one of the chapters in Real Characters, the one by Reba Tukaczynski and uh, Sarah Erickson, is about what happens when there's an actor character incongruence. So you know a role, you know a character, and then that actor, you, let's say you like the character, and then the actor goes and does something that's incongruent with that role. Let's say that the character is really nice and you find something awful you know, that the, um, the actor has done. Well, that tends to have an effect on your relationship, your parasocial relationship with the character because you say like, I cannot watch anything anymore with that person in it because they're bad, you know? So the actor has then um, colored your vision of the character and you think I'm just not going to watch anything like that. So that kind of reveals some of the, the process. And so when I say um, characters are real, that's kind of what I mean, that they have a reality. Yes, we know they're fiction. It's not as simple as that because real people write the stories and real people play the characters and they are often based on situations that do happen in life or that the, the reality, the psychological reality of the situation could happen in real life. Um, a person, for instance, could be like Spock. They don't have to be from a fictional planet. Um, and so then the reality in our real everyday world interactions are to say, no, I cannot watch that show because that character is now spoiled for me. So these are some of the, the bits of psychology that I play with um, in my work. So I'm going to end that uh, screen share here and uh, I'll go back to the, the title slide, but um, I'll turn it over to, to Jean-Pierre to uh, have a little talk with me about real characters. Yes, let's have a little therapy session about this issue. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, it's uh, it's wonderful. Um, you know, uh, I, I I still remember when I first met Karen. Uh, Karen had just flown. Do you remember that day, Karen? I do. You you and Jason. Santa Barbara, and you were going to. Uh, I'm not sure if you were applying for the professor or the program director position of media psychology. Yeah, both. Yeah. Yeah. That was the job. And uh, I remember she was standing in outside the uh, Santa Barbara airport with a little suitcase, and I pulled up, and uh, and we drove from the airport to um, the hotel, the uh, uh, Best Barker Hotel, where where session was being held. And during that ride, I I immediately grasped that what we had here was a real powerhouse in scholarship and that we would oh, be you, incredibly incredibly fortunate to have her and I remember that happen. moment too I remember landing at the old Santa Barbara airport and yeah. it was so charming and you get your luggage outside with palm trees <laughs> and I'm a girl from the midwest so I was like oh my god <laughs> this is amazing and of course it, it you was and Nirvana Jason for you amazing. I, yeah so anyway so, ever since yeah. um, I have so enjoyed working with with Karen first as a co-faculty in the School of Media and the program of media psychology, and then even later 
when I moved to HOD. And so, uh, um, you know, Karen has been a very active publisher and you know, she wrote the handbook of media psychology for Oxford University Press. Yes, and I'm her, working on the second edition now with Elizabeth Cohen, co-editor, yeah. There you go. So when we set up Fielding University Press now five years ago, uh, I started to hound her. I said, look, you, you're working with the enemy, you know, Oxford University. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, we, we want you to write a media, uh, a handbook of media psychology for the university where I was born, which is Fielding University. You know, I feel bad. <laughs> and she had to think about it for a moment. And, I, and then she said, you know, uh, there's good news and bad news. I said, the bad news is I cannot do that because that's what I do for, for Oxford. She said, but I, I can give you something else. And I said, well, what is that? And she says, I want to write a book about, with my students and alumni, about parasocial relationships, which is a topic that in media psychology we, we have explored for many years. And she says, it's going, to, it's going to be called Real Characters, and it's going to be great. <laughs> and uh, basically, that was it. And ever since then, we've been working on this book. And uh, uh, and it's been such a marvelous book. I mean, I have it right here. Uh, oh, I've never seen it in, in person. Oh, yeah. You haven't still, no. yeah. This is the thing that, um, you know, we're get all of our contributors to this book are getting a, a copy of the book. They are called so-called author copies, but Amazon is running a huge backlog in author copy production. So have no fear the order is in and it will arrive very soon but as you can when, see, when we agreed to do this junk here i believe it was january a year ago and the whole thing is done now awesome are we I good know, or what <laughs> i know i was you know usually producing a book like this takes a year and a half but you know when karen is in charge that's it you know pew, out of the gate full blast so uh you know, you you had all your your delivery times on target. You know, the review, the everything, the copy editing, the graphics were done. And and in the book, we decided that because we're talking about parasocial characters, we want to have real some of these characters. So we, there are a lot of photographs of people acting out the character that they want to be, uh, to underscore, to illustrate. This, uh, this sense of parasocial relationships. For example, here in the chapter, how media users form romantic relationships with characters, which um, you know, actually also should have included my case study. You know, in the 60s, when I was a little boy, I must confess now for the first time publicly that I was deeply in love with Emma Peel, the oh. star of the Avengers. Now, of course, I'm dating myself. <laughs> Most people on the call won't even know what that is. Emma Google Peele, that. <laughs> gorgeous woman. Yes. And I was deeply in love with her. I've never really gotten over that particular situation. But here, you know, here's a wonderful picture of uh, Buzz, two people kissing, <laughs> kissing uh, a character playing Buzz from Toy Story. In any case, it's a, it's, it's a marvelous book. And I, I'm going to ask a few questions about it, but I, I first want to just follow up on what you're mentioning, talking about Leonard Nimoy. You know, when I finished my doctoral work at Columbia University in New York in the late 70s, um, uh, I was, I, you know, we all need a break in our life. And I got an incredible break. I came out of university and I was casting about for something to do. I wound up working for the American Council for the Arts. And before long, I find myself first consulting, then writing, then writing, directing, and producing a film about Vincent van Gogh, uh, starring Leonard Nimoy. And yes, uh, yes. It, was an, it was an incredible experience, I remember. I, was, I forgot you were the, the producer and director. You directed director, that? Director, yeah. That's I first beautiful. consulted on it, and then I said, well, can you write the screenplay? I wrote the screenplay, and then I said, you know, I want it to be this, and I think it should be that. They said, well, why don't you direct it then? I said, okay, fine. <laughs> and, uh, and I spent two weeks with Leonard. Um, we started filming in Holland, actually in near the town where I was born, Eindhoven, and of course the local newspaper and all the TV was out there. Mm -hmm. And then we moved our way in the footsteps of Van Gogh, uh, to uh, France, to Paris, and to Arles, and uh, Provence, and so forth. And you really get to know 
uh, an actor when you do that. I mean, I've worked with um, Hollywood um, celebrities uh, on some of my films, but this was a really unique situation because I really, you know, we we worked with him for two weeks and he, he insisted on sleeping in the same hotel where the crew was based. You know, there were fancier hotels, but um, he was a, a wonderful man. I, I really, um, he was so humble and so human. And he picked my brain constantly about this character, Vincent van Gogh, because, you know, he, 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 he thought he knew a lot about it, but he, he just wanted to know more and more and more. And there was one, no, I, I should not describe this one. <laughs> Anyways, um, <laughs> well, uh, there is a funny that, story uh, about first it. First of all, but, jump here, I want to say that movie is like um, something, if you see a biography of uh, Leonard Nimoy, they will always include that film and some wonderful stills from it. And so congratulations on having that. And I, I, was, I was talking earlier about my own parasocial relationship I've never met Leonard Nimoy, but um, definitely I feel like I know him. So that's that's part of this whole equation, feeling that you know someone from hearing them speak over the years and forming a picture. And that's that's how we form a picture of the people who are actually in our lives, uh, our aunts and uncles. We may see them once a year, but we have this idea of who they are. So it's, it's the psychology of perception. Um, well, let me ask you this question, because when you go through the book, I mean, obviously you have you bring to many different perspectives together on this social parasocial relationship. And the question that I think many people would have is, is, is there a conclusion in the book? I mean, are parasocial relationships, is that a good thing in modern society or not? How, how would you answer that question? That's a good question. So I spend a lot of time trying to undo negative stereotypes about fans. Um, and we're all nowadays fans of something. I think it would be difficult to not be a fan of something in the media. And fandom has been a maligned identity in the past, but it, I think it's much more acceptable. Who knows, I, I should ask you sometime whether you think Hollywood has cultivated that because now it's a cool thing to go to Comic-Con and there are so many people there, whereas, you know, my husband might have get might got punched out in high school for being a Star Trek fan because he was a nerd, you know, that kind of thing. But um, but so I, I come at this with the, the notion that a lot of times people see being a fan and everything that comes with it as negative or misguided. And so I have to do a lot of talking to people where I say, there are misguided fan behaviors. I was talking about stalking, and we have colleagues at Fielding who are actually clinical psychologists in LA. So they have clients who are actually stalking a celebrity. So that's real. Um, my, uh, my stuff lies in the middle of the normal curve. Everyday people who just admire someone, you know, um, and, and form a connection. And I think the, the main um, message that I'm trying to put out there is that is essentially the same psychological behavior as forming a friendship. A lot of relationships happen in your imagination. We all imagine conversations with people who are actually in our lives. And we might imagine talking to Leonard Nimoy. It's just the way our brain works. So it's normal human psychology. And um, um, in some of my writings, I take pains to, to sort of go through what should be obvious, but you don't sometimes think of it this way, that characters and celebrities are so, um, they're extreme in many ways. Like they are selected for their good looks, you know? There are, if you saw them on the street, if I saw Chris Helmsworth on the street, I would just probably pass out because <laughs> it would be a phenomenon, you know? Those people are cultivated, I think especially so in Hollywood um, for their looks, but then also, you know, the biggest stars I think are people who are beautiful, um, but they're also um, extraordinarily talented. And we could talk about beauty and whether that's fair. Um, I actually watch, watch a lot of British TV because I want to see some people with crooked teeth and who look like, you know, everyday people doing stuff. Then we have reality TV that gives us um, wrong things and right things, I guess. But um, the point being, of course, we're very attracted to people who are very attractive and very talented. It's not, it's not rocket science to understand why we would all be interested in that. Our brains are hardwired that way, you know? So, um, I think that it's mostly, it expands our horizons. Um, there's a theory by Michael Slater and Slater works with Dave Ewaldson, who's one of the book chapters, uh, authors. 
it's called t -butts, temporarily expanding the boundaries of the self. And it means um, that when I step into the shoes of a character, I am expanding the boundaries of myself. I am going to places I've never been, time periods I've never been, having thoughts that I haven't had, being a person that I'm not. And so it's imagination. I, I call it, I did a TEDx talk in uh, the end of 2019. Little did I know everything was shut down uh, right after that. <laughs> but um, so I'm glad I did it and, and live, and live in person. But um, uh, so we've got, we've got this opportunity to have so many different experiences. And that is um, often great. It's often positive. And I've done some research that shows that fans, being a fan of something is associated with well-being, not with being mentally ill. Um, and, and I am surprised, uh, not, not in a good way, how often people in journalism or public life talk about fans as if we are mostly pathological when people are mostly doing things in a very natural way that actually expands our horizons. Like I mentioned in the talk that people who read more fiction show more empathy because we take other people's perspectives and their perspectives we don't have or views that we don't share. Um, so uh, yeah, it is uh, a takeaway is that it's normal and that it can really lead to good things. That, that, that's a great answer. Of course, I, I was just thinking about the, the, the parasocial relationship and having a large following also places a responsibility on the celebrity in question. And, and, and I was just thinking about it because Earlier this week on Monday, I was interviewed by the Guardian newspaper about a, a book that I wrote that's coming out next month about Salvador Dali, uh, who was well, the, one of the first artists to cultivate celebrity and to make him turn himself into a brand and to do some pretty awful things, actually, uh, as an artist that further cultivated his following. And this afternoon, I'm going to be interviewed by a French crew about my work with Charlton Heston, who was probably the star of his time. Mm -hmm. He had a great following, but he tried to do something positive with it. And, you know, and, and uh, I, I wrote a book with him. I directed him various programs. And he once told me that the thing that he was most proud of in his career, literally, even though he is a Republican and all that good stuff, is that when he heard about Martin Luther King calling a march to Washington from Marlon Brando, uh, Marlon Brando called him up and said, you know, you, you've got to get all of us to go there uh, because you're the president. He was the president of SAG at the time, the Screen Actors Guild. And Chuck said, uh, you're right. That's what we're going to do. And so Chuck called everyone in Hollywood that he knew of, even actors that he clashed with, including Marlon Brando, many, many times. And he led a large delegation of celebrities to the march to Washington. And he said that whatever I've done, in my, that's the one thing he's very proud of. So would you agree that fandom does also play a, a great responsibility on the celebrities to use that wisely or, or to not to exploit that? Yes, and I think sometimes it seems unfair to the, to the celebrity and we don't really adjust for how, how much um, of a struggle that is. Um, and so if you look across my different books, you can see I'm struggling with this myself. I'm trying to help us all think about it together. So. My first book was called How Fantasy Becomes Reality. And um, in 2020, I had a book called Finding Truth in Fiction. So fantasy, reality, truth, fiction, real characters. Um, it's all me like thinking through all of these things. And um, so Charlton Heston being proud of leading a march um, that he, he was able to be a leader because he was known as a, an artist. So that is fantasy and reality. That's what I mean by that. that Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, that he gained celebrity. And again, for a variety of reasons, being an excellent artist, being in popular media, being attractive in all these different ways. Um, and that allowed him that power. Um, but I often think about celebrities and how they're, they're held to such a high standard. 
if you have five minutes with, um, you know, uh, oh gosh, um, who's a who's an A-list actor of the day? I don't, I can't even. I'm too old to think of that. <laughs> of, of today? Yeah. Oh wow, um, uh, A-list actors of today. Uh, I don't even know. Let's just pick Tom Hanks because everyone knows who that is. Okay, so if you had five minutes with Tom Hanks, you you know you were doing an interview okay. with him or something, you would expect him to be so nice, and, and he is, as I understand that, but we're all not nice all the time, right? And so <laughs> if Tom Hanks had a cranky moment, then people might blow that out of proportion. Oh, Tom Hanks, you know, snapped at the um, assistant or, you know, whatever. Well, you know, we get a lot more um, understanding in a way because we're not held to that to that standard. And yes, people would say sort of, oh, poor baby, because they're rich and they're famous and everything. But um, for me, I often think about the Beatles and uh, I'm a huge uh, Paul McCartney fan. I kind of think he might be a deity, I'm not sure, but he's just so great and um, just such a musical genius. And um, so I think about the Beatles though, like I was born in 1969. And so that stuff had happened like before I was even born. But I think about those women who would scream and pass out at their concerts. And I understand that, <laughs> but it's like, how would it feel for you to be a, a man, a musician and have women just pass out literally because, because they are seeing you sing, you know? And, well, and ironically, yeah. part of the breakup was they could not hear themselves at concerts anymore because of the screaming. <laughs> That's interesting. By the way, why don't you stop your screen share so people can see the both of us uh, at the same time. Oh, yes. Good, good idea. Yes. Yeah. Good yeah, it's interesting that you uh, mentioned that because, uh, you know, I, I was honored to write a preface to the book. And I, I know the fact that the same thing was true with Johann Strauss in Vienna in the mid 19th century when Johann Strauss would show up and do his thing. Uh, people would faint and scream and women would become so it's it's not something of, amazing. <laughs> of, of, of today you know and the same thing with uh, with Chopin now, Frédéric Chopin was a sex idol was a pop icon and the same thing women swooning and screaming and and uh, had to be dragged away and so mm -hmm. nothing new under the sun we have some questions from uh, from our audience Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm going to uh, give those to you. Do you believe, one of our participants saying, do you believe video game media, such as The Sims, are helpful in reflecting social integration, learning, etc.? Or are there media resource games that you would suggest to encourage learning and engagement? Well, um, I know what The Sims is, but I, I'm, I don't have a depth of knowledge to be able to say exactly for that. But the concept I think I understand, which is that The Sims is a game which simulates life. That's what Sims means. So like, um, let's see, what's the name for that? There's a name for video games where you, like they're called time management or you have to do various tasks. Um, right. I, I never want to play those games because I think that's what I do in life. <laughs> Why would I play a game about time management? <laughs> but um I'm more of a bejeweled kind of person. But um, so I will say this broadly that um, games um, based on their psychological structure and their reward um, properties are excellent teachers. And I was talking earlier about how um, the authors of A Theory of Narrative Thought said that a good story is better than a true one. And this is an example of what I mean by this. I used to do media violence research and every time um, I talked to someone, the first question and the main question was, are video games bad? And I thought that that was an absurd question. It's like saying, are books bad? Is television, you know, it's like, what? <laughs> That's not the question. And um, people get really polarized in media psychology. They, they seem to think they either have to think everything is a terrible risk or everything is only a boon, only to be you know, appreciated. And of course, life has risks and opportunities. Everything has risks and opportunities. You know, you could, uh, you could theoretically, you can drink too much water and die. You know, it, there, you, you, have to, you have to look at balance, but um, the, the structure, the psychological structure of games does lend themselves to learning. Um, and there are whole people who, there are whole groups that study serious games, learning games, exercise games. And I do think that the video game industry gets a bad rap. And I, I think people would think that I contributed to that because I studied media violence. So I'll put that out there. But um, in studying media violence, I didn't mean to say 
all games cause violence or all violent games cause violence or um, that games are bad. It's, it's just like saying, um, if you take the format out of it completely, if you get a diet of a lot of violence, that's just gonna prime thoughts about violence. That's just, it's just like Sesame Street. You know, if you get a diet of a lot of kindness and good manners, the premise is that that will transfer to our kids and, and they'll, they'll think of those as norms. Or like in today's um, political society where we talk about lots of incivility and unprecedented things that have happened, if you set a standard, people might live up or down to that standard. So I just wanna say all games are not bad. And um, even media violence research, the premise is not that what playing violent video games causes all the violence in our, our society. It's just saying that uh, when you think a lot about violent messages or when violence is um, rewarded, for instance, and that's something to think about, because again, the reward structure of games is one thing that makes them powerful. So games, um, and, and a good story is better than the truth. People think if I did a media violence study, that means I hate video games, which is also absurd because if I hated video games, I wouldn't have chosen it as a topic to spend a great deal of my life on, right? Um, so, but people think simplistically, but um, yeah, I think that there are, um, all kinds of interactive tools, games included, that can can be very good for learning. Um, and then, you know, the the difficult side. Sometimes um, our graduate Don Grant, he's a therapist in LA, and he works with what he calls device management, which is um, for people who've have gotten into a situation where using their phone and things has become pathological. It starts to interfere with their their life, or their use of social media has started to create pathological ideas. And so it's not the idea that phones are bad or anything like that, but that um, we all have to figure out a way to manage the, the input that we have. And if we go too far, we might need some help reining that in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. We, we, uh, we, at one point I, I designed a game um, for about uh, Hamlet, the mo motion picture produced by Kenneth Branagh for Castle mm -hmm. Rock Entertainment. And uh, we did it in such a way that if you did the whole game correctly, you saved Hamlet and Hamlet became king at the end using outtakes from the motion picture. So absolutely storytelling. And, and it's so right what you say that there are stories don't necessarily need to be true. They need to be good. And that is so true because when you look at our heritage, you know, whether it's uh, in ancient uh, Greece, whether it's in the Bible, Hebrew scripture, these are all stories, stories with heroes and heroines, and we want to associate with those heroes, whether it's Abraham or David, we want to associate with these characters. They become real, real elements, real figures for us, and that's what drives much of our civilization. Here's a, a, a question from uh, one of the per people who are watching who uh, which really resonates with me. Uh, the person is asking, "How are the lives of celebrities who portray villains affected when audiences identify a hate relationship with a the character they portray?" And and if audience were to, uh, no, uh, people were to see that celebrity in the streets, would they go out and punch him? You know, <laughs> and it's yeah. funny because in the preface for the book, I write that. Uh, a real story of Tally Savalas. Again, I'm dating myself. This was a big, big series in the 70s. He played Kojak, a police detective. And when, when Tally went out on the street, people would really accost them and say, how could you let that, how could you screw up that case? You know, as if he was a real person. So is it difficult? How does that affect people who, who play these villains? Yes, and, and please chime in with this because you have a lot of experience working in the industry and living in LA. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, psychologists would call it a misattribution. You're attributing a character's personality to the, to the um, star. And Reva Tukachinsky, who's one of our authors, a student of Jonathan Cohen, who is um, the author of the most famous definition of identification that I went over. Um, they write about actor character incongruence and, and, and how, that, how that works. But yeah, certainly people misattribute that, that that person literally is the character. And I'm sure you know a lot of stories where people will just talk to the celebrity as if they are the character. You know, if they play a detective, 
then they want him to solve a crime. Um, I read, so um, for some of my uh, work, I read David Suchet's entire book about being Hercule Poirot. Um, I love Agatha Christie. And so Poirot is one of her famous detectives. And so he would be in full costume, which is rather elaborate somewhere. And he was standing on a street somewhere in the Southern England one time. And a little old lady came up to him and said like, I hope there's not gonna be any trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Because it'd be like running into Columbo or, you know, another detective like, oh, there's there's been a murder, you know. Um, so, yeah, we um, and that's why people, I think, make fun sometimes of fans because they think they've lost track of reality. But it's it's not an easy distinction. Sometimes you even if we don't walk up to a detective on TV and say, you know, or walk up to someone who plays a doctor like uh, George Clooney in ER. Hey, I've got this problem with my elbow or something. But yeah, you know, people people get mistreated or, or yelled at or what have you, or booed um, because they're the villain. Um, and I have a quote in Finding Truth in Fiction from um, Henry Winkler, who played, talk about, so all my references are from the 70s, I don't know why, but Henry Winkler played a Fonzie, the character on Happy Days, who is a real cool guy, which actually Henry Winkler says is very different from who he is. Um, and he says everywhere he goes, all around the world, people will just say, oh, Fonzie, you know, I need to hug you and come over for dinner. And he says, you know, he's been the recipient of all of that goodwill because if they think you're a great character, or they might ask him like, oh, the girls are just going to come running, you know, like Fonzie would snap his fingers and girls would just come running. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's absolutely true. Uh, you know, here in LA, there's sort of this communal ethos that we try to uh, honor, which is when you see a celebrity in a restaurant or something like that, you, you got to play it cool. You know, that's, Los Angelinos know that because, you know, uh, the, the, you run into people, at least before COVID, we used to run into people all the time. And and I'm always impressed with, uh, uh, you know, traveling with Leonard and, and with Chuck Heston is that how they deal when people break into, you know, for example, I, I have a dinner with Leonard and people just break into the dinner and say, oh, Dr. Spock, can you please sign this for me for my <laughs> child? And it's so rude. Mm -hmm. uh, and and yet they, real actors deal with that with grace. They really, because they say, here's another customer, right? Here's another fan who I cannot piss her off or him off because it'll spread and whatever. This was before social media. So absolutely. We have uh, time for one more very, very quick uh, question before we wrap it up at um, 11.30 ET, 8.30 my time. And that is, uh, here's the question. In Matrix Reloaded, Agent Smith, a digital being, infiltrated and influenced the real world. What fictional characters do you believe had have infiltrated and influenced the human social psyche? Oh, what a wonderful question. I need to save that from the chat and write that down. Yeah, um, I have done some research, some searching for times when fiction has influenced real life. One thing that comes to mind, this is not about the character per se, but um, if you remember in the 80s, and in the 80s, I was a kid in school, um, there was a film called The Day After, which is about like a nuclear yeah. winter. And um, Ronald Reagan said that he influenced his policy decisions watching it. And that's a great example, I think, because um, it's about imagination. All of this could be labeled imagination. I call it guided imagination when, a, when an author writes something. Um, it gives us something concrete to hold on to. Like now I can see those scenes of what would happen if nuclear winter came. Uh, I don't have to think of it in my own mind. I've got the pictures. So um, something like that. Um, people over the years have cited various things. I'm trying to think of other examples. So sometimes it is something that's very like uh, of the moment politically, like uh, Tom Hanks, speaking of him, was in um, Philadelphia about the AIDS crisis. Um, and, and people will cite those as examples again, because we've helped them imagine. We, I, I started the talk out by saying, I used to believe that everything was about facts and data. And I had to totally throw that out and go, no, what, what pe the fundamental thing that people digest are stories. So I need to change my whole life as a psychologist and, and know that. And so um, you, could, you could say like, okay, so I've seen this story play out. And so I don't want it to happen in real life or I do want something to change in real life. And that's, um, so let me take the example of Black Panther because I've done some research on that um, recently. 
So uh, in a study that I did with a, a number of our students and alums, um, we did an experiment where mostly youth of color watched Black Panther and they had their phones with them and they filled out surveys before and after. And bottom line, we found that especially Black youth were empowered by Black Panther. Um, so in other words, inspiration that you can actually think, okay, now I've seen this vision of what if Black, black um, um, citizens of the United States, let's say, were resourced correctly and had uh, um, the same things, the same privilege that white people do, for instance, what would that look like? And so it's just a vision of if you took away the imbalance, if you gave a community um, funds and technology, what would that look like? And, and to help people actually see that, for me, my favorite character from Black Panther was Shuri, who is Black Panther to T'Challa's sister. She is a scientist and she's working in a lab and she has everything she needs. She has all these materials and she can create um, anything, cars, weapons, you know, all these things. I personally thought it was a missed opportunity. They needed to have a Shuri lab toy. I would have bought that and played with it all. But um, it's, well, you know, why do we have all these action figures that they just shoot? But anyway, um, so that's, that's a vivid shared imagination. And Black Panther you know, the, the understanding in Hollywood for years was, oh, we can't have like a primary black cast that won't sell or something because people are, they're more white people, let's say in America, but that's wrong. We just saw that um, it's one of the top grossing movies on the planet. Um, it is incredible um, how well it did. And that picture, uh, we also did a follow-up qualitative study and that picture means a lot to people. They can tell you, what it meant to them about community, about all kinds of identity issues. And that's that's the impetus for me doing that research on portrayals. So uh, for instance, like an LGBTQ character, if that's a, um, a group that in the past hasn't gotten enough representation, we need to tell more stories and they need to come from that community primarily so that people can just envision, um, people can know more, people can feel an intimacy with someone um, Again, temporarily expanding the boundaries of the self. If you don't have the opportunity to have those experiences, then it's been shown that there's a theory that if you watch someone like you connect with another person in a story, that means you have like permission to connect with people like that in a story. Um, even here's another 70s reference. So Archie Bunker, you know, the whole thing with Norman Lear. Norman Lear's a big. Um, you know, he wanted to send messages with his media. And some people didn't get it and they thought Archie Bunker was being, you know, <laughs> but that was the message, his words were the message, but it was supposed to be ironic, right? That we would look at the other characters who were different in, in the way that they thought. But then in the story, the Jeffersons came into the story and Edith and Mrs. Jefferson, uh, Wheezy, you know, became close friends. And, and again, seeing someone like yourself in a friendship with someone different that did change people's realities and, and that kind of character has lasting impact. Very good. Well, we have to leave it here. We're at the end of our time. Thank you so much, Karen, for this wonderful book. And for all of those of you who are watching, Real Characters is available from Amazon as both a printed book and an ebook, instantly downloadable. So after this session and after the next session, when you take a break, run to your Amazon account and get real characters. And thank you so much, Karen, for this wonderful book. And thank you, Hillary, for hosting this discussion. Over back to you. Thank you, Jean-Pierre. Always wonderful talking to you. And thank you, Hillary. You're pulling up an amazing session for the university. Bye, everyone. Thanks for coming. <laughs>